Hello, and I hope you're having a great day today. We're going to be looking at lesson four network hardware in this video. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. So we've gone through quite a lot of this material already, but now we're on to this bit here, which is just all the kind of key hardware that we need to know about and describe for the exam. So in terms of network hardware, a variety of hardware is required to set up and run a network. Things like network interface controller slash cards, network switches, wireless access points, routers, cables, and of course the actual devices that we want to connect to our network. The first bit of hardware we're going to look at is the network interface controller or the network interface card, either is acceptable. A NIC, an NIC, enables a computer to be connected to a network. The first bit of hardware we're going to look at is the network interface controller or the network interface card, both are acceptable. A NIC, an NIC, enables a computer to be connected to a network. Modern computers include one as part of the circuitry on their motherboard, but they used to be separate devices, these cards that you'd plug into your laptop or your desktop to enable them to connect to, say, an Ethernet cable or to connect to a, a Wi-Fi access point. Most laptops and mobile devices have wireless NICs built into them, and each NIC has a media access control MAC address that is unique to that card so that each device can be identified on a land and data sent to the correct device. So here we're looking at some of the properties of a device and we can see here we've got what it calls the physical address, the MAC address of that device. And the MAC address is how we identify computers on a local area network. And this is different from the IP address, which is how you identify devices on a wide area network. These MAC addresses are hardwired into the network interface card, and that's usually built into modern computers. The next device we need to look at is the switch, a network switch. A network switch is a piece of hardware that allows multiple devices to be connected together to form a wired network. So for example, in my computer classroom at the school I work in, we've got one of these mounted on the wall. And all the Ethernet cables from all the different computers in the lab are plugged into it. And it's got lots of green lights that flicker on and off and it looks quite colorful and can be very distracting to the students. But obviously all those Ethernet cables that plug into the back of each computer need to come together somewhere to connect to the main network. And they do that with a switch. So switches group computers together in a local area network. A switch stores the MAC address of every device connected to it in a table. When the switch receives a packet of data, it looks at the destination address and forwards it to the intended device. It is possible to connect multiple switches together to increase the number of devices on a network. If you're looking at an older textbook or an older YouTube video, you might see mention of a similar device called a hub. A hub is like an old fashioned version of a switch. It links together all the cables on a wired network, but it's not as intelligent as a switch. A switch looks at a packet of data and only forwards it to the one computer that requires it. A hub takes that packet of data and just sends it to every computer on the network and just says, okay, if this information is for you, please use it. If not, ignore it. So you can see with that sort of philosophy, a hub is not going to be as secure as a switch because you're relying on that computer saying, oh, that's not a packet of data for me, I'll ignore it. Now we move on to the wireless access point. A WAP connects Wi-Fi devices to a wired network without using physical cables. Sometimes we talk about this as a wireless router or a Wi-Fi router. Uh, we're gonna refer to it as a wireless access point just so we don't get mixed up with an actual router that we'll talk about a little bit later. But I'm sure we recognize these. You might see them at home, at schools and offices. They've got the antenna here perhaps. Don't always have to have antenna. You can have an internal antenna, but these are for sending and receiving radio signals. As long as people are within range of the WAP, they can still move around and about from room to room and still be able to access the network. WAPs broadcast what we call the service set identifier, the SSID, which is effectively the name for the network so that Wi-Fi devices can connect to it. 
the WAP then sends the wireless data that it receives onto the main wired network. So again, I'm sure you're very familiar with this. You know, you turn on your phone or your laptop and you're looking for the right Wi-Fi signal and you can see lots of SSIDs and you choose the one that you can connect to. Usually it's the one that you have the password to so that you can send your data uh, securely. The WAP is usually connected to a network switch via cable. However, we can also connect wireless access points to other wireless access points to exchange, sorry, to exchange, to extend the range of a wireless network by sending and receiving data from one WAP to another. So for example, you might do this in your house or your school or an office. You've got your one wireless access point that has a limited range. So at the end of that range you have another wireless access point they don't need a cable between them because they can obviously communicate wirelessly. So you've got this wireless bridge from one wireless access point to the next wireless access point. Wireless access points broadcast the data to every device connected to the Wi-Fi network. This can be a security issue as anyone connected to the network can then access these data packets. This is why we usually encrypt wireless data so that only the right person can decrypt that data and then use it on their computer. Remember also that the bandwidth of a wireless network is also typically less than a wired network. It can also be shared between many more users. Now we'll move on to a router. And a router is a very important device, and it also looks a little bit like a switch and a wireless access point, but in fact is different. And I'll go into some of these differences in a moment. But right now a router is a device that connects different networks together most typically a local area network to a wide area network, such as the internet. So again, as it says here, we need a router to connect our home or office or school LAN to the internet. A router reads a data packet's IP address, not the MAC address, and uses this to route the data to its destination by the fastest available path. Routers inspect the destination IP address of a data packet to determine whether it is located on the local network. If not, the data packet is passed on to the connected network. Routers collect data about all the available routes to transmit data and then determine the most appropriate route for each individual data packet. Key functions of a router include receiving packets from the network, directing packets to their destination, forwarding packets to the network, connecting different networks together, for example, LANs to WANs, has a public IP address for local area networks, and can designate private IP addresses to network nodes. So let's have a look at some of this hardware all being used together. So we can see we've got maybe different groups of computers. So we've got one room of computers here, these all connect together with a switch. We've got another room of devices here, these all connect together with a switch. And then these connect to the router. We also have a Wi-Fi access point, a wireless access point. Here it's called a wireless router. Uh, that's another name for it typically. And again, this connects devices wirelessly. Again, connects them all to the same network. And then we've got this router here, which then connects things to the internet. It connects the local area network that we have to the wide area network of the internet. And all these devices have slightly different functions. So the wireless access point connects all the wireless devices together on our local area network. The switches put together all the cabled computers together via ethernet onto our network. And then the router is connecting everything from a local area network to a wide area network. So if you have a look at switches, routers, and WAPs, on a home network, often the router, the switch, and the wireless access point are all combined into a single device. So at home, a lot of you will just have one device that is all three of these combined. Or might you, maybe you have two devices that work together to do all the functionality, okay? Usually at home, we don't have a lot of individual devices. But on a larger network, like an office or a school or university, we do tend to separate the functionality here. So remember, switches connect wired devices to a local area network. A wireless access point connects wireless devices to a local area network, and routers connect different types of network together. Don't get these confused in the exam. These devices can look quite similar, but just remember they have different functionality. But again, do remember that in a home network, 
you might just have one device that combines all the functionality together. Let's have another look at transmission media because it's an easy area for people to forget about. Start with copper wire. Standard network cables consist of eight individual copper wires that are arranged in pairs and twisted together to reduce interference. These are commonly known as ethernet cables. Data is transmitted as electrical signals and there are different ratings that indicate how quickly data can be reliably transmitted over and what range. So you'll often hear people talk about CAT5 cables, CAT6 cables, CAT6E cables, and these are just different categories of ethernet cable. Bandwidth for copper wires is generally between 100 megabits per second and one gigabit per second for a distance of up to around 100 meters. So remember we're measuring the bandwidth here and we do that in bits per second, not bytes per second. So when I say one gigabit per second, that's gigabit, not gigabyte. Again, it's easy to confuse. Most PCs have built-in LAN ports, Ethernet cable slots, so that connecting computers using copper wire can be a cost-effective option if the bandwidth is adequate. So typically for most people, you know, 100 megabits per second is fine. For larger institutions, one gigabit per second is going to give you plenty of bandwidth for many computers connected together. Fiber optic cables are made of thin glass strands or fibers, which transmit data as pulses of light. As they use the light to transmit data, they do not suffer from electromagnetic interference. Fiber optic cables do not break easily as they're strong, pretty flexible, and of course they don't corrode like copper. Fiber optic cables have very, very high bandwidth and can reach speeds, or bandwidths at least, measured in terabits per second or more, and are capable of transmitting data over distances of 100 kilometers or sometimes even more than that. Recently, a new record was set for fiber capacity. Uh, this is researchers working in a lab, it's not real world conditions, but they managed to get a bandwidth of 2.15 petabits per second, almost said terabits per second, petabits per second, which to put it into context is enough to download all the written works of the human race in every language in three seconds. For these reasons, we often use fiber optic to connect together WANs across large geographic areas. The cables that cross oceans to connect different continents together are fiber optic cables. You also have to remember the fiber optic cables, they're a lot slimmer and a lot lighter than copper cables. So in the kind of same space, they can have one big thick copper cable, you can have multiple fiber optic cables, each of these operating at terabits per second to give you huge bandwidth across very long distances. You then build in repeaters to amplify signals and you can stretch that cable across oceans. So here we've got a map of some of the different fiber optic cables. These are sub mostly submarine fiber optic cables. They stretch across oceans to link all the different continents of the world together. And you can see a lot of them are grouped together in the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean because so much data gets transmitted between these. If we have a look at one of the more recent cables that's been completed, this is the Maria submarine cable. And this stretches 6,644 kilometers between the US and Spain, completed in 2017, and can deliver up to 160 terabits per second. Again, that's a huge number. To put that into context, it can stream 71 million high definition videos at the same time. This would have been this would have costed hundreds of millions of dollars, certainly. And it's interestingly that this was actually funded mostly by Microsoft and Facebook. Um, most of these cables are built by big telecommunications companies, but increasingly kind of software companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Google are funding cables because they need this capacity for the services that they offer, especially cloud computing, cloud storage. We also have radio waves. Wireless networking technology such as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uses radio waves to connect devices. Radio waves form part of the electromagnetic spectrum and their use is strictly controlled by governments. There are certain frequencies that you can use for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and only those and those are allocated by governments around the world. Typically for Wi-Fi, uh, we're looking at uh, frequencies around 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. And the speeds that you can get can vary, 
but under typical conditions, you're looking at 450 megabits per second on the 2.4 gigahertz scale and up to around 1.3 gigabits per second on the 5 gigahertz scale. Obviously, this depends on the router and the version of Wi-Fi that you're using. Uh, very recently, we've had the newest version of Wi-Fi released. It's version 6. Uh, sometimes you refer to, you'll see it referred to as AX. And this can support up to 10 gigabits per second. But obviously, this is only under ideal circumstances. With Wi-Fi, you get lots of interference. You're not going to get absolutely those speeds. You're just going to get part of it. So in summary, there is a variety of hardware that's required to set up and run a network. You need to make sure you can describe each of these in a reasonable amount of detail. So you've got your network interface, controller or card, your NIC, your network switch, your wireless access point, your router, and the use of cables such as Ethernet or fiber optic, as well as, of course, using radio waves for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Well, that video went on a bit longer than I was expecting. Hopefully you found it informative. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know uh, down below. But apart from that, I will wish you a good day. And please have good luck with your studies.